So uh, before I start with the session, uh, I would like to share some figures with you. Uh, in India, every year, 10 to 15, 10,000 to 15,000 children are born with thalassemia major. And this is the highest in the world. And uh, at a given point of time in our country, there is about like 1.5 lakh thalassemic patients in the country. And more than 1 lakh patients die in the country before they turn 20 years due to the lack of the access to the proper treatment. Um, also, well, sorry, ma'am. Uh, sorry to interfere. Actually, the slides are not moving, ma'am. Uh, you need to stop sharing and share the slide right? share, ma'am. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Wait, I'll stop it. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Now it's okay. It's visible. Um, uh, no, but I'll have to uh, uh, do, uh, stop slide sharing. No? Sorry. So, oh. Wait. Yes, yeah, I'm so sorry. I, I no, it's ma'am. I'm not able to do that actually. Uh, wait. Yes, ma'am. Is it visible now? Yes, ma'am, yeah. visible. And uh, is it moving now? No, ma'am. It's only the PPT. It's not moving. All right, ma'am. Then you can uh, you can go to next slide uh, manually. You can click here, ma'am. Then. All right. All right. I'll do that. Are you able to see now? No. No, no, not at ma'am. Mm, wait, wait. Uh, let me try once. Uh, yes, ma'am. All right, I think, uh, I don't know, I'll check with this uh, sharing issue and all. Okay. So, uh, I'll run it in this way, way only. For oh, sure, ma'am, we'll so, proceed, yes. Yeah. So, uh, as I said, uh, before I start with the session, I would like to share uh, some facts and figures with you. So, in India... Every year, 10 to 15,000 children are born with thalassemia major, which is the highest in the world. And at, a, at any given point of time in India, we have around 1.5 lakh children who are suffering from thalassemia. And approximately one third, uh, one third of uh, two third of them die before the age of 20 or before they enter their. Uh, proper adulthood due to the lack of access to the treatment. Also, in India, every year, or uh, to put it in a more simple way, every six minutes, one person is diagnosed with blood cancer. And unfortunately, out of this people, so what, every six minutes, one person, so per day, around 240 people are diagnosed with blood cancer. And unfortunately, out of this, 30% are children. So, uh, as you have already studied, the uh, permanent cure for these children is the uh, blood stem cell transplant or the hematopoietic cell transplants. So, what is it? It is basically a blood stem cell transplant, but we introduce or we uh, perform this transplant for pediatric uh, uh, patients with specialized uh, medical procedures involved in it and we look forward them to come out of it and complete, get completely cured. So when we are uh, uh, thinking of, uh, you know, uh, the hematopoietic cell uh, transplant in uh, children, we have to, like, you know, take care of uh, certain things or points to, you know, taken into consideration while uh, we are planning for a uh, HCT in, a children, in children. So that involves the pediatric specific considerations. This involves the age consideration, the conditioning regimen, and the, uh, there are other factors we will see in the subsequent night. Protocol and procedures, sorry, protocol and procedures, 
regimen considerations and uh, source of stem cell and all. And long term outcome is, you know, the long term these psychological and physiological uh, impacts of transplant on the children who are uh, who have already undergone the HCT. So let us begin with the first. It is pediatric considerations or pediatric specific consideration which involve the age and disease development state stage. I would say age, disease and disease development stage. Disease type is donor selection and psychological support. So let us begin with age. So age and disease development stage, uh, again, the as I said, uh, every six minutes in India, one person is diagnosed with the blood disorder and out of them 30% are children. So age of these children may vary from as small as like six months old or two months old to the adolescents. So in my uh, career with Datri, I have seen uh, children who are undergoing transplant as young as nine months old to the adolescents up, in up to 17 years. Ideally, uh, uh, I'll talk more about it when I talk about the disease types. And also, uh, when we are considering uh, the uh, pediatric uh, specific considerations, we need to uh, think about the physiological and psychological needs of these children because as you see the age uh, range age uh, the age of this patient varies from infants to adolescents and children are more vulnerable like when they are facing such issues during their teenage so uh, their uh, psychological and physiological need also has to be kept in mind when we are planning hct for these children so the disease types uh, for which we are considering or uh, which uh, are treatable through HCT is malignant and non-malignant hematopoietic uh, disorders. So uh, malignant, you have already uh, studied about or learned about these disorders. So can someone tell me uh, what is uh, malignant hematopoietic disorders? Uh, you can just type in the chat, chat box. What are the malignant hematopoietic disorders that are uh, treatable through uh, HCT? You can speak out also. Am I audible? Hello? No one? Yes, ma'am, you are audible. Okay, so what are the malignant uh, hematopoietic disorders that are treatable through HCT? Can anyone tell me? Ma'am? Yeah, please. Are, uh, yeah, please. These are actually uh, the blood cancers, which are right. like un uncontrolled proliferation of the blood cells or precharges or the progenitors that fails to mature or show improper maturation in the body. Right. So, uh, also, um, um, such as uh, with your voice is, uh, who is talking, I don't know. Uh, whoever is talking, um, I'm not leukemia. Okay. So, uh, and what are the non-malignant hematopoietic disorders that are treatable through uh, uh, HCT? All right. So, uh, the C's types or uh, the malignant disorders that are treatable through HCT in adults as well as in uh, pediatric patients are leukemias, lymphomas, and other hematological cancers. And non malignant uh, disorders that are treatable. Through uh, the HCT are inherited disorders like thalassemia, sickle cell, etc. And the non metallurgical diseases include severe autoimmune diseases, metabolic disorders, and solid tumor may also benefit from HCT. 
So these are the various disease types and based on the type of disease, the doctor will decide who will be the suitable donor for this patients. So donor selection. Once the disease is identified and once it is decided that, you know, this child, specifically in um, the non-malignant diseases, the permanent cure has, is only the uh, blood stem cell transplant, like in thalassemia or sickle cell diseases, children cannot survive uh, or they may not lead, uh, may not be able to lead a long and healthy life without the uh, HCT. So, uh, donor next, when it comes to donor selection, ideal case will be the sibling or the cord blood unit of the child itself. So, uh, if this is not possible, then the only option left with uh, the other options are the pa child's parents or relatives. Relatives as in the maternal uncles and aunts, paternal uncles and aunts. And uh, maybe in some cases we have seen uh, the child's or the patient's cousins have also found to be a match. So again, that uh, of course the siblings, parents or uh, the uncle aunts and the cousins fall into the allergenic trans allergenic HCT category. Uh, and uh, otherwise in non-malignant diseases, autologous transplant doesn't help. I hope you are aware of allergenic and uh, the autologous transplants. Right, sir? Pamsi, sir? Are these children aware of uh, this yes, disease? I mean, auto, auto yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Right. Yes. Right. right. And uh, if no match is found within the family, the patient has to look for the unrelated donors. So, finding the appropriate donor with a suitable HLA typing match is essential to minimize the risk of GVHD and improve the transplant outcomes. Psychological support is critical when it comes to uh, particularly the adolescent or teenage uh, patients and uh, not only uh, the children but the family also requires the psychological support. I would like uh, say that the psychological support is required in case of adults as well. But when it comes to, you know, uh, the pediatric uh, patients, then uh, mainly the teenagers do need more psychological support and uh, uh, child life uh, specialists, psychologists and social workers play a key role in, you know, supporting these patients throughout their transplant journey. The next consideration is the protocols and the procedures after uh, considering about the pediatric specific considerations, which includes the age, disease type, and uh, uh, we already discussed as the donor selection process. We next comes as the protocol and procedures. So in protocol and procedures, we uh, take into consideration the pre-transplant evaluation of the patient what will be the conditioning regimen and stem cell source, what is going to be the stem cell source. And once uh, all everything is in place, the infusion and the engraftment of the stem cell is, needs to be considered. So, pre-transplant evaluation includes the series of assess overall health, organ function and sustainability, uh, suitability for transplantation. So, for example, I will uh, give you a case of uh, a thalassemic child uh, whose spleen has to be in you know proper condition or in good health condition before the child undergoes the transplant. Or uh, one of the hematological uh, parameter that doctors uh, check before accepting the child for transplant is the ferritin level of the child. So, ferritin level has to be uh, like under 500 for a child to undergo the blood stem cell transplant. Uh, when it comes to suitability uh, or overall health, uh, for example, in case of a child who is diagnosed with ALL or leukemia for that matter, who has already undergone chemotherapy sessions, so chemotherapy has already taken a toll on child's health. So first the child needs to recover from side effects of the chemotherapy and then only if the child goes for uh, the transplant process, the outcome will be 
very good. So all this uh, necessities and overall health of the child has to be uh, taken into consideration and which is a part of the pre-transplant evaluations. This is uh, this is this is uh, the uh, conditioning regimen which is being like you know uh, followed and as I as it is already mentioned here the goal is to prepare the uh, conditioning regimen goal is to prepare or suppress the immune system and creating the space for the uh, donor cells in the bone marrow so uh, that is why this is being observed next is stem cell source before conditioning uh, regimen is observed the stem cell source has to be finalized or donor has to be ready to donate so typically uh, uh, when the blood stem cell transplant happens ideally as soon as the stem cells are received from the donor they should be transfused to the patient so in that case uh, one side by we start the condition uh, we start the uh, preparation on the donor side as and as well as at the same time the conditioning regimen of the patient will also be uh, monitored or will be done started so both goes in parallel so when a donor is ready for the donation uh, as you will learn let, in the later sessions uh, during the peripheral blood stem cell donation we give gcsf injection to the donor so when the day one of uh, the gcsf injection for the donor starts by that time, the patient's conditioning regimen also starts. And at the day when the donor donates his or her stem cells, we call it as day zero. Or And uh, when the donor's GCSF injection starts, we call it as day six. Day six to day one, five days, GCSF injection is administered. Day zero is the donation. Similarly, for patient, also, the day six, the conditioning regimen starts. Day six or day five, the conditioning regimen starts depending on the disease and the age of the patient. And on day zero, uh, normally, patient's conditioning will begin one day after the GCSF of the donor starts. And when donor donates, uh, on day zero, when donor donates his or her stem cells, for that, uh, that uh, day for the patient is day one. And next day when the cells are received or same day when the cells are received, it is transfused to the patient. We call this as the direct infusion process, wherein as soon as the stem cells are received, they are given to the patients. During uh, the COVID time, we face the issues of transportation and all limitations. So doctors started cryopreserving the stem cells. So once the donation of the stem cells is over, the patient's donor cells are carried in a special temperature control box and made it reach to the patient location. They are preserved at cryo temperature and then the conditioning of the patient will begin so that the patient's life will not be at risk because of the uh, travel restrictions and all. Uh, uh, if the cells reaches late to the patient location, and in that case, when the patient is ready or immunity is suppressed, infections may attack to the patient. So during those times, the cryopreservation of the cells practice has begun. And still, in some cases, uh, the cryopreservation of the cell is still going on. So uh, before the conditioning of the patient is starts, we need to finalize the source of the stem cells. And again, the source of the stem cell may vary on the factors such as patient's age and disease. So if the patient is like child up to like, you know, infants, uh, uh, right from infant age to up to like 10, 12 years, cord blood, cord blood cells would be sufficient quantity. Otherwise, if the child the diagnosis and again, I would put one more thing here is the weight of the patient is also important while deciding the source of the stem cells because a child may be of around like 12 years of age, but the weight is high, then probably the cord, cell, cord blood cells quantity may not be enough. So in that case, the cells from the uh, another donor or allogenic stem cell transplant may be required in that case. So the source of uh, blood stem cell would be decided based on the age and the disease. And option includes the bone marrow, peripheral blood stem cells and cord blood cells. So I will give you an example of a bone marrow uh, uh, transplant. 
as well as the peripheral cells also. So uh, I'll, I'll show you and I'll talk about to you when it comes. Uh, based on what factors the bone marrow donation was requested from a donor. Cord blood cells uh, is particularly suitable for infants and younger children. So as I said, because the weight of these children is less, so the quantity of the cord blood cells are sufficient for these children. As well as, again, the cord, uh, selecting the cord blood cells as the so stem cell source, uh, you know the benefits of it. Can anybody tell me what are the benefits of going for cord blood cell at CT? Anyone? See, there's a one-year-old child and his or her parents has already preserved his or her cord blood cells and uh, later when the child is one year or whatever, a disease is diagnosed where the child has to undergo HCT or maybe a child and he or she has found a matched cord blood cell. Ma'am? Yeah. Maybe um, cord, cord HCT has a high... Um high supply of cells also it prevents the rejection like it has a low chance of rejection because it's the same cells from the person extract correct any other has it to anything do with gvhd all right think about it we will discuss it in the next session so uh, the next point to consider after after the stem cell source is finalized, the condition and regiment is done. Next comes is the infusion of the stem cells and engraftment. So the actual transplant involves the infusion of the donor cells into the pediatric patient's bloodstream, which is like infused in the same way as the blood is uh, transfused. And uh, then the stem cells migrate to the bone marrow and where they gradually engraft and we begin production of the healthy blood stem cells. And monitoring the engraftment is a crucial part of the process. So can anybody tell me uh, how long uh, will it take uh, for the engraftment of the stem, stem cells and how long will it take uh, for you know the stem cells to start producing the new cells? after the uh, donor blood stem cells are infused or transfused other, rather. No one? It takes somewhere between 21 days to one month's time. And like yesterday night only I got a case uh, from CMC Ludhiana wherein there is a patient uh, who has just, it's, of course, it's an adult patient who has just undergone the blood stem cell transplant. And uh, his even after a month, his WBC are not increasing. So uh, uh, whatever treatment is to be given to that patient is being given. At the same time, it was a request from for me uh, uh, and the the patient's family requested me to you know help them with finding the WBC donor. So in that case, in such cases, the matched blood stem cell donors, uh, uh, matched bl blood group donors, WBC has to be transfused to the patient body so that by the time the cells migrate and start produce uh, producing healthy blood stem cells, these WBCs will protect the patient. So another question, uh, as you might have studied, blood group matching is not required for blood stem cell transplant, right? So there's a case wherein uh, the patient's blood group before transplant was A positive uh, and the donor's blood group is O positive. Now in this case, when the uh, cells, stem cells have not engrafted and have not started producing the healthy blood cells. What group of, what blood group of WBC should be given to that patient? A positive, O positive. Anyone? 
मैम वो पॉजिटिव मैम टू माई नॉलेज आई एम थिंकिंग ऑलरेडीवेटिवेटिवेटिवेटिवेटिवेटिवेटिवेटिवेटिवेटिवेटिवेटिवेटिवेटिवेटिवेटिवेटिवेटिवेटिवेटिवेटिवेटिवेटि
the patient has to go for uh, the monitor and managing the late effects and all. And after one year, um, like monthly or uh, bi-monthly follow-ups are required. And once like uh, two years, three years are over, yearly follow-up. But yearly follow-up is required in uh, lifelong for this patients. Quality uh, is the key consideration because uh, the transplant may affect uh, the physical health, psychological well-being because when the transplant is undergoing, the child, the patient has to face many physical issues as well. Uh, and uh, probably you might be you know, aware the GVHT uh, can affect the looks of the patient also. And if in that case, the patient is a teenager, it may have a psychological impact on the child. So psychological well-being and emotional also has to be taken care of. Social integration is also important. But at the same time, uh, social uh, involvement is still avoided uh, for this patient for at least up to for one year. I mean, uh, they ideally they should not go in the crowd at at least till one year. After that, yes. But then probably uh, if the child has the good psychological support, uh, the social integration becomes easy. So uh, these are the uh, like you know uh, factors yes, which need to be taken into consideration. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, uh, ma'am, I think time is up, and we will meet again at eleven o'clock.